Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks to everybody for joining us um, today. I'm Alison Ogley. You might know me already, um, but I'm one of the partners in the Planning and Environment team here at Walker Morris. Today's session is all about natural capital, uh, a topic of increasing interest and awareness in both the business world and, of course, in, in wider society, helped, of course, by people like David Attenborough and Greta Thunberg and the increasing awareness that we need to act now to try and make sure that we do protect resources uh, for the future. I'm joined today by Sue Swain and Stuart Lenton from SLR. We'll be hoping to give you a, a, an overview of what natural capital is all about and how it connects into other environmental regulation and how if you adopt a natural capital approach it can actually help you with your compliance issues. In terms of format, I'll shortly ask Stuart and Sue uh, to introduce themselves. There'll then be a presentation by Stuart for about 20 minutes. They'll pass back to me for a presentation again about 20 minutes and then we'll have a question and answer session. We're also going to be running uh, three interactive polls for you to join in with if you would like to. So there'll be multiple choice questions. It'll take about a minute. You'll have about a minute to react to them. And the first one will be coming out to you now, I hope. Um, so now I'll hand over first to Sue to let her introduce herself. Thanks, Alison. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you're all well. Um, I'm Sue Swain. I'm the, I've got several roles within SLR. I'm head of our industry business, which is basically all of our manufacturing clients. Um, I'm also head of client management, uh, which covers all the sectors that we operate in in Europe. And most importantly for, for, for this afternoon, I'm one of the leads in terms of natural capital, along with Stuart. Um, and I first started getting engaged in natural capital over two years ago now. Um, and have the benefit of talking to a range of clients and organisations about sort of how to approach natural capital and the benefits it'll, it'll bring to their businesses. So I'll hand over to Stuart now. Thanks, Sue. Just make sure I'm not on mute. Um, good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Um, yeah, my name is Stuart Lenton. Um, I'm uh, with SLR Consulting, and um, my sort of primary role is one of the uh, operations managers. I look after about a fifth of our European business, and that includes uh, one of the teams I'm responsible for is the Ecology and Biodiversity team. That was my first introduction to natural capital um, a couple of years ago. Um, I sit on the EIC Natural Capital Task Force, and as Sue said, probably most importantly for this discussion is I'm one of the uh, natural capital leads at SLR. Thank you. Thanks, Stuart. I think we'll be going straight into your presentation now. If you want to pull your slides up and we'll, uh, we'll hand over back to you. Here we go, technology. Can everybody see that? Someone could just give me a, a nod or a say yes, that'd be great. Um, so um, thank you, everybody. Welcome uh, today. I'm just going to try and uh, turn my camera off, actually, but that might be a bit difficult now. Um, yeah, well, welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. It's great to be able to speak to you on this, what is a very important and emerging topic. Um, hopefully, you'll find this presentation helpful. Um, we're going to start with an overview of what natural capital is, uh, to look at the drivers and then how it's important for businesses. And then obviously Alison um, will follow on with her presentation and then we can have a broader discussion as part of the panel debate um, after that. So I've, um, I've mentioned about me. Um, so natural capital, what does it mean? Obviously, we're all aware of the global environmental challenges that we're facing at the moment, sustainability issues, climate change. And, and the, the key issue is that we're, sustain, we're consuming natural resources in an unsustainable way. So natural capital, um, you can see there on the slide that they're, that they're essentially into two key headings. Natural capital is the physical stocks of um, natural resources, things like air, land, minerals, etc. And from those stocks, we derive um, benefits which are referred to as ecosystem services. And you can see there 
Uh, on the right-hand column, that think that's things like uh, climate control, waste decomposition, uh, etc., production of water. And these essentially provide the population with the means for healthy lives, and they underpin all of our economic activities. As a society, we're extracting about 50% more now than we did 30 years ago, and that's, that rate's increasing more now than it ever has in, in, in history. And obviously, depleting natural capital stocks leads to the inability to generate the ecosystem services that we so heavily rely upon. And we need to decouple growth and our env environmental footprint. So in a little bit more detail, you know, ecosystem services support our survival and our quality of life. You can see in a bit more detail what they are there. I, I think a particularly interesting one is, is, the, is the, the fourth one down, the cultural aspect. Um, that, that thing, it includes things like spiritual, recreational, aesthetic, that kind of thing. Um, the, there are essentially two types of, of ecosystem services. There's the material type, which is things like food, water, timber, uh, waste decomposition, etc. And then the, there is the sort of non-material, the spiritual well-being, those kind of things. The term natural capital was first brought about or first used in, in 1973 by a gentleman um, by the name of E.F. Schumacher in a book called Small is Beautiful. So this is clearly something that's been around for a long time. It's not anything new. It was further developed in the 1980s um, by the founders of eco ecological economics um, as a critique, as part of a critique of the shortcomings of con conventional economics. And more now it's generally considered to be, um, it revolves around the idea that non-human life produces goods and services that are essential to life. And therefore, natural capital is an essential to the sustainability of our economies. So as we've said already, the key issue uh, around natural capital is the unsustainable use of natural resources. You can see there, in very simple terms, unsustainable consumption of uh, our resources leads to the inability to provide ecosystem services, and that leads to societal impacts. So just some contextual elements, um, just some examples. Um, uh, there's this global uh, shortage of sand at the moment. It might, might seem hard to believe, but it's the second most uh, used resource behind water. And obviously, in an increasingly urbanised world, um, it, it, it's, it's being used very heavily. And it's an important component of concrete. And just some slightly scary statistics. In, in, uh, between the years 2011 and 2013, China used more uh, concrete than uh, the US did in the entire of the 20th century. I think that just gives you an idea of, of, of you know, so it highlights some of the issues. Uh, Europe is a, is a net importer of resources, and therefore we benefit from a major transfer of resources from lower poor, uh, poorer, lower consuming countries. And in the 1970s, there was a tipping point identified where it was established that um, our consumption of natural resources outstripped the planet's ability to effectively provide for our needs. There are now twice as many people on the planet as there were at that time. And so you can imagine there, and, and there's an organization called the Global uh, Footprint Network, and they calculate that for the year 2020, if you look at it over that period, the tipping point would be the 22nd of August. So beyond that point, we're consuming resources um, beyond that means. So why is natural capital important for businesses? Um, obviously, this is set to become a major challenge for businesses in the 21st century. Things like population growth, climate change will exacerbate demands on the Earth's resources. And obviously, businesses cannot continue to take these for granted. So we need a change in mindset. So here on this slide, you can see that they're just a, a, an example. Uh, you know, all businesses have both impacts and dependencies upon natural capital. And these give rise to a range of risks, business risks. You can see there some examples of, of, of where they where they would sit, things like through the supply chain and, and, and obviously raw material supply, things like business continuity and resilience, even things like you know, reputation, stakeholders. So all of these things are important for businesses to, to, to consider. And most businesses have some idea of where they uh, may have an environmental, environmental impact, but very few have an idea of their dependencies or their future risks and liabilities. Uh, for example, you know, most manufacturing replies on a supply of fresh water. And for some businesses, the scarcity or over-regulation of that will, will become an issue. Just a couple of examples um, of business brands that you may be familiar with. Uh, L'Oreal, the com cosmetics um, organization, studied all the plants that used in its cosmetics products, and it identified 40% of its revenue 
uh, came from biodiversity, and that, 40, uh, and that a significant proportion of those were at risk of being lost. <clears throat> it's now moved to developing a lot of its products through renewable resources, and it's also developed things like uh, product scoring. And I'll talk a little bit more about the way uh, co consumption choice is, is driving, but they've obviously seen an opportunity there to provide information to enable people to make a more informed choice around um, sustainability of, of, of the products that, that, that they produce. Similarly, an organization like Unilever, um, it established that obviously a big impact to, um, from their products it, uh, came about in the way that people use their products. So things like cleaning products, um, skin cleansing, hair washing, they all require energy as well as water. And, and obviously they've looked at developing new products now that um, are reformulated to, to use less water, uh, to use less heat in water. And that's a good example of where um, organizations have adapted or adapting their products to try and meet the requirements of consumers whilst providing a, a, a better environmental performance. And that's just a very simple example. There are lots, lots, lots more, but that just highlights the point. And obviously until now, uh, accounting and business models have generally failed to account um, for the environment um, and how they form a, a crucial part of supply chains. Uh, your businesses generally have tended to assume that uh, you know things like water uh, and raw materials are going to be infinite and freely available. And, and, and so, so companies that embrace natural capital are, are likely to get to grips with the challenge of the 21st century um, in a better way. So I'd just like to talk now a little bit more about the drivers behind natural capital. So I've broken this down into to sort of two key areas. One is to talk about the legislative drivers and the things that are more visible. And then secondly, just to talk a little bit more about um, the business drivers and the things that businesses are using um, to look at this. So you can see there, most of you will be familiar with most of this, I would imagine. So obviously, um, the Natural Capital Coalition, which is now part of the Socials, uh, the Capitals Coalition, sorry. Um, it's a space for organisations of all descriptions to come together and share best practice to tackle the collective challenges. Um, and that's a great organisation. So there's a lot of good tools on their website and good information. Um, at a national level, we've got the Natural Capital Committee. Its mandate was to run until this year. That's an expert panel that advises government, and that was behind the 25-year environment plan that you may be familiar with. Then at the start of this year, some of you may have seen there was some guidance published um, uh, on enabling a natural capital approach. There's some good tools and good information on there. A lot of that's about biodiversity and footprint, um, but that's uh, de definitely something worth taking a look at. Um, the Environment Bill, again, you'll probably be familiar with that. That's likely to come in possibly next year, depending on, obviously, what happens with COVID. Um, um, but that will obviously bring about um, the, mandate, the mandatory biodiversity net gains. That will be a for all development through every planning application, 110% of biodiversity value on a site that's measured by the DEFRA bio, uh, biometric 110% uh, will need to be replaced either um, on the site or through a different site or through a different scheme. That's going to have an impact almost um, immediately, and I'll just talk in a moment about how that's actually already present in a number of um, ways already. And then finally, um, we've got the Ecometric, which is being introduced by Natural England. That's the development of the Biometric. And that looks at um, measuring the wider natural capital benefits from ecosystem services. So it drives optimization of wider natural capital gains from biodiversity, from the idea that if you invest in biodiversity, you get ecosystem service benefits as well. And examples of that might be things like flood control, water quality, carbon storage, recreation, you know, well-being, all of those kind of things. So you can see here, uh, natural capital is mentioned in the na National Planning Policy pr uh, Framework. Um, I don't propose to read that out, but again, that just shows that it's already present. And similarly, um, you can see here from the South Downs Local Plan, this is just an example of where natural capital and ecosystem services um, is already in play for a lot of um, um, development er areas. And, uh, and we've been involved in pr providing ecosystem services assessments as part of planning applications. Uh, for some time now, and that's definitely something that, that's that's in play already. So a lot of that um, is is very much sort of footprint led around biodiversity value. Um, there are obviously a lot of businesses don't have uh, biodiversity or footprints, and and there are different drivers. 
Um, so I'm just going to run through these. Uh, the, the, there are sort of four key areas in total. Um, so obviously one of the key things is brand and reputation. So a lot of businesses are very aware that um, it's important that their brand is, is, is considered to be strong and a greater focus on, on the sort of ethical and environmental performance around businesses. And obviously, consumers are making far better and informed choices um, around that. So, so businesses are getting savvy to the fact that they need to make sure that their brand is well positioned. And obviously, that can have a knock-on impact on things like um, share price, shareholder value, uh, and expectations, and then obviously that feeds into things like ESG and CSR as well. And then things like uh, financial investment. Um, so uh, you know, in increasingly the investment community is becoming alive and aware of, of the importance of environmental performance. Younger investors are making decisions based on environmental performance. Um, we've, we've seen um, even evidence of, of investment funds outperforming, sorry, environmental investment funds outperforming conventional stock. And obviously there's a positive benefit around share price protection. Um, we've even seen examples of preferential finance being given on, on environmental performance. And in fact, it was really timely. Alison will probably talk about this, but shared a really interesting um, article from one of the broadsheets this week that, that, that highlighted where 30 of the world's largest asset owners were looking to, um, that had a combined value of 3.8 trillion pounds. And they, they're committing to cutting carbon emissions um, by up to 30% from uh, all of their investments. And that was not necessarily just about um, divesting from um, environmentally um, poor performing businesses, um, but it was about really trying to drive expectation around where they were invested. So that was going to in involve things like pushing companies to supply mandatory climate reports um, and clear business transition plans. So I think, again, this is something that businesses have got to be alive to. Um, you know, we, we're seeing, I even had a call this week from a client about um, who haven't done any ESG reporting at all. You know, they, they've got a great business. It's a fairly new business. They're doing lots of really positive things in this space, but suddenly they were, you know, shareholders are saying, you know, where's, where's your ESG reporting? And, and, and there's a whole piece for them to go through, not only just in terms of actually producing their reporting, um, but also about creating a strategy and sort of creating a vision as part of their sort of future ambition. So next, there's an important piece here around um, staff engagement, recruitment, retention. Uh, again, I think increasingly people are being aware of, of um, the performance of their employer and, and looking, so new recruits are looking at businesses, particularly um, you know, younger recruits are looking at how businesses are positioned. They, they, they care more now about the companies they're working for and their environmental performance, which is, which is great. It's a great way of engaging positively with the workforce. Um, I think it's a it's a great opportunity to 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 look at staff retention and obviously there's a piece about about well-being. So I think um, you know, there's a whole range of things there that will imp impact on, um, on on a business's workforce. And then finally, and this is probably the most important one for businesses, obviously understanding the business risks. And we talked a little bit earlier on about. Um, where those risks sit, you know, right through the supply chain, value chain, throughout the whole operation. It's not just about the operational aspects. And obviously, there's a change in, in the marketplace, and it's important businesses to see what others are doing and how that they might um, maintain their own um, performance. So as we can see here, um, it's not a one-size-fits-all at all. Um, businesses will be looking at this through different lenses with different requirements. It might be across different aspects. There'll be different drivers for them, whether it's around risk, whether it's around investor sentiment. But a natural a, a capital approach, which we'll talk about in a moment, can actually help to mitigate risk and can help with all of these aspects. And it helps promote the long-term resilience of the business. It can even provide innovation and, and open up opportunities for new revenue streams, new market opportunities. I'm just going to talk a little bit now about what a natural capital approach looks like uh, for those that, of you that, that, that don't know. Um, so it's a development of the, the sort of concept of sustainability. Uh, many businesses, as you'll be aware, have a, a well-developed um, sustainability initiative. Um, quite often, companies have got um, sustainability reporting, sustainability 
plans. The sustainability as a term came about from the Rio summit in 1992, and um, sustainability generally tends to focus on things like water usage, carbon, waste, energy, and it doesn't necessarily always consider the broader umbrella of natural capital and biodiversity um, as well. So at its simple level, uh, a natural capital approach involves understanding the impacts and dependencies, as we talked about early, and it's, a, it's about essentially establishing a baseline. And from that, it's about developing a strategy for improvement. Sorry, there's just somebody just at the door. You can always trust um, the, door to, the doorbell to go at the wrong moment. Um, apologies for that distraction. Um, it's then about developing a natural capital approach. Um, finally, it's, it, it's it, you know, taking it to its next step would be about um, assigning numerical or monetary values, and obviously the most sophisticated and developed way is to, um, to, to develop a full sort of a, a environmental profit and loss account or environmental balance sheet. One of the challenges around this uh, are things like, um, you know, the sort of knowing what's in scope. Um, you know, there's, there's an opportunity for businesses to... Um, change the way they operate um, and, and through, through developing their natural capital approach. So what are the benefits? So the benefits, as we talked about some of this already, um, it can pro pro provide um, um, drivers for behaviours, it can provide a, a, a opportunities to engage better with your workforce, it can provide cost savings, it manages risk, and obviously it can enhance um, business reputation. The challenges. So, as I said, knowing what's in scope, where to start, how to take your existing sustainability initiatives and develop those into a natural capital approach. It's really important to gain uh, buy-in from all stakeholders. Um, and, and I think that, you know, obviously placing monetary and numerical values is subjective. Some people don't, um, don't necessarily agree that that's the right way to go. The important thing is actually doing something though and actually making a start. So just a bit about now about what companies are doing. Again, we've sort of touched on some of these already. Uh, there's some you know, different examples are things like you know looking at this over an operational site, um, looking at this over a broader area of land. So examples are where you know a business that has a large footprint you know might be able to do um, biodiversity management. So I know. A company like Anglian Water, they've got something like 8,000 um, physical assets from everything from simple substations through to um, something like um, Rutland Water. And, and they've, they've done an assessment of all of their um, operations and they've scored them from a biodiversity point of view and they've looked at how they can manage the best of those to create immediate improvement. And you can see there uh, things like product life cycle, the whole value chain, uh, the whole supply chain. So it's, it's different for, for um, all companies. Um, and then the, the final point on that one there that's, that's really interesting is, is investing in managed habitats. Some of you will already be aware of this, and, and some industries are actually positioning to support with this. So, you know, you imagine for the development sector, if you're a housing developer and you've got... Um, you know, a large site, but you've got to replace 110% of the biodiversity value. That could have a significant impact on the footprint of that site and the developable area. So there may be opportunities for you to invest in off-site um, off biodiversity management. And that's an area where things like the minerals industry are very keen to, to understand how they can help with that. A lot of land ownerships, big estates are looking at ways in which they can help with that. And there'll be opportunities to bring together uh, those that have and those that need. And I know there are organisations like um, the Environment Bank that are looking to um, to, to offer the sort of brokerage uh, connectivity sort of service. Um, and then the final point on there is sort of incentivising the supply chain. We've even seen examples of where, um, where, where um, farmers are being incentivised through environmental performance to get better prices for um, um, some of their products. So what comes next? So uh, just just to sort of wrap up, really, just a, a, a summary of the you know the impl implementation of the Environment Bill. Um, it, so that'll be biodiversity net gain. The ecometric will come in and impact upon development. But increasingly, as I talked about earlier, you'll see that um, you know there are a lot of business drivers from from sort of shareholder, consumer, 
uh, employee are all um, are all driving this through through different means, and so it's really important that businesses start to look at this from a from a risk and a strategy point of view. There's obviously even a sort of post COVID effect. Um, I think that you know we, we've all sort of seen the benefits of of, of, of you know less travel, potentially um, different ways of working, um, and so there's going to obviously going to be be, be some impact from from that as well. So that's really all I have to say. I hope um, that's been useful this morning. I think we'll save questions for the discussion at the end. Um, and I think we're going to have another poll now. So um, I look forward to speaking to people at the end of this uh, for the presentation. Thank you. Thanks very much, Stuart. That's great. Uh, very interesting. I'll um, just get my slides up now, if I can. Hopefully I won't be... Uh defeated by technical issues again. There we go. Can everybody see the slides? Yes, we can see Alison. That's very helpful. Thank you. So let's get these started off. Okay, right. So uh, thanks again, everyone, for joining us. And thanks, Stuart, for a really informative discussion on how natural capital accounting works for businesses. I'm going to look more at the legal issues um, that are sort of caught up with uh, with natural capital. Um, and I'll do a little, a bit of a, as quick a counter through as I, as I can. Um, so just moving on to the first slide, really, this is about minimizing the risk of environmental liabilities and also maximizing potential for development whether that means you know new development in the planning context or, or you know the development of your business and generating income streams or preserving your position in the market in terms of you know making sure that your brand stays strong protecting your reputation, increasing market share uh, and also protecting uh, the supply of critical raw materials. So in terms of extent of potential exposure, in terms of environmental regulation, there has been an increased risk in terms of enforcement. So we've seen a removal of maximum financial penalties for many environmental offences, and we've seen some very big fines uh, come through as a result of that. And even with the use of things like civil sanctions, such as enforcement undertakings, financial liability for environmental risks can be significant. And the point about taking a natural capital approach is that these should really help your business to um, take a holistic view and actually avoid these risks and, and stop the issues occurring before you get there. So in terms of prosecutions, just some quick figures to counter through. So it, we can see the, the, the fines, the average fine between 17 and 18 compared to 13 and 14. There's obviously a, a massive jump up from about 20,000 to nearly 150,000. So that's the effect of the removal of the cap on some of the environmental regulations that we have that impose criminal liability. We've obviously seen, um, you know, really big fines, a million pounds, a two million pounds in 2016 for one of the water companies. Uh, we've also seen uh, BIFA fined in the region of six, 600,000 for breaches of waste export regulations. So when the Environment Agency or other re regulators do take action, it can result in some really big financial consequences in terms of criminal exposure to fines alone. The same applies for civil sanctions. So really the whole point of a civil sanction with an enforcement undertaking is to actually remediate the environmental harm that's been caused. But even in that context, we've still seen contributions pushing up to a million. Um, more often than not, they are somewhere between the 50 to £100,000 mark. But again, not an insignificant amount of money for a business to be exposed to. Uh, and that's obviously in addition to remediation costs. So if you actually served with something like an environment damage liability notice, which is something that the EA have had a power to use for many years, actually since 2008, I think, um, but haven't actually taken that forward very much. They've now shown uh, a willingness to start to use that particular um, tool in their box, as it were. Uh, so in one particular instance in, in 2018, we've seen an environmental damage liability notice require a polluter to investigate and design remediation strategies for 50 kilometres of a river 
install fish refuges, restock the river, and then have a 10-year requirement to monitor and maintain improvements that have actually been delivered. So again, in terms of financial exposure, you're not looking at insignificant sums. So in terms of minimising and avoiding sanctions, there are, of course, a, a wide array of regulatory controls for the environment, and it's issues that do have to be grappled with by a broad spectrum of businesses. I'm not going to get stuck into the detail of that today because we'd need an awful lot more time. But just some key examples are things like managing waste and duty of care, which can affect every business, trade effluent consents and water discharge limits. Obviously, that depends on the nature of your business, but it will affect a lot of manufacturers, for example. Water abstraction, again, particularly relevant for many businesses, including food and drink. One-off pollution incidents, I mean, they can happen to, to any business. Things like nuisance as well, where you have um, either statutory or civil nuisance cases. So, you know, they can be a big drag on time. You can end up with having to have very expensive uh, remedial work done to deal with nuisance if you don't head that off at the pass. There's obviously some special considerations that apply to particular operations if you're um, manage under an environmental permit, for example, including things like waste activities, landfills, energy from waste, composting, etc. There's also some novel developing areas that people do need to be aware of. So the first thing that I mentioned there is the Vedanta case. Now this is particularly important because what this case concerned was the potential for a UK parent company to be directly liable for a failure under environmental law of Zambia for the actions of a subsidiary company in Zambia. So the, the broadly, the, the quick facts of the case, if it were, copper mine in Zambia, the local community alleged that the, there was a discharge of toxic ma matter into the watercourse, local community affected health issues, damage to property, etc. So the Supreme Court decided that the parent company Vedanta could actually be at direct risk of environmental liability under uh, negligence laws, Zambian negligence laws. It was, however, on a fact-specific basis, really came down to whether or not the parent company held itself out to have a degree of control over environmental compliance for the whole group, including the um, Zambian uh, copper mine. Now, the important point there is the Supreme Court found that there was actually a real tribal issue. So they were looking at things like jurisdiction, so whether or not the English courts could even interfere in this particular matter. They found that they could. The other more important issue as well is that the court found as a matter of principle that the parent company could be liable for the environmental damage caused by its subsidiary even if it didn't actually have any control over the subsidiary, as long as it held itself out to have that control. So there are developing areas here that businesses need to be aware of, particularly if they are in, in broader group companies that are operating in different jurisdictions. There's obviously a potential for this to impact on supply chain, so things like the need for raw materials resulting in environmental damage, such as palm oil, uh, you know, so the, the loss of, of rainforests in Borneo, for example. And there are increased risks uh, given increased environmental litigation by the third sector, that should say. Apologies for the typo. So you may have already heard of Client Earth. They're a very active uh, litigation group who are acting on behalf of the Earth. There's also uh, lots of examples of cases being uh, brought through crowdfunding on environmental issues. You might have seen in the news recently that we've also had um, Fergal Sharkey uh, make a, a claim against the Environment Agency, a judicial review action, uh, in respect of the alleged failure to control and monitor water quality. So it is sort of coming at businesses from lots of different angles. Now, one of the positive things, potentially for businesses, though, is biodiversity net gain, which you've already heard Stuart mention. Now, one of the things that's going to be a, a sort of a, a drain on, on businesses, potentially, on this particular point, is if you are proposing new development, then you're going to have to provide 10% net gain as a mandatory requirement once the Environment Bill actually comes into force. There will be a two-year transition period, and at the moment, that is stalled. But you do need to be aware, if you're in the planning arena, that at the end of the day, right now, local planning authorities are already looking to impose uh, biodiversity net gain requirements on developers. The good news is, however, that outside of that planning sphere, um, 
biodiversity gains can be a source of relatively easy wins for existing businesses. So you can either do on-site biodiversity net gain, depending on how much land you've got, or you can do offsetting, so off-site. And Stuart already mentioned this in respect of, uh, as well, offsetting um, carbon emissions. So you can invest in managed habitat that's actually being looked after by somebody else. A good example you might be aware of already, the Exmoor Carbon Project. So they're managing the woodland on the Exmoor um, natural reserve to ensure that it can increase local biodiversity there and obviously sequester carbon. So they're effectively looking for investors to come in, provide them money so that they can actually deliver the carbon offsetting for those particular businesses. That's for food and drink business, but ultimately lots of clients that I'm aware of are, are developing their own relationships with the third sector. So people like lo what local wildlife trusts, for example, to make sure that they can deliver some biodiversity net gains, that all feeds into their natural capital. For some businesses, uh, and again, as Stuart mentioned, if you're lucky enough to have a significant land holding, Biodiversity net gain can actually be an opportunity for additional income stream. So there is a potential there for you to be able to sell credits to others. So what might be coming up next? The next two slides look at the current DEFRA consultation. So what's happening is there's a proposal to introduce new regulation to protect rainforest commodities um, in other jurisdictions, so across the world. The idea is to make uh, certain companies publish information to show where key commodities come from. So they're looking at things like beef, cocoa, rubber, soy and palm oil. So they want to be able to sort of impose a due diligence requirement on businesses operating in the UK to demonstrate that if they're using those raw materials, they're coming from sustainable supply sources. It is intended at the moment that that will be regulated by way of criminal fines, potentially. So if you're within scope of the, the future regulations and you don't do what you're supposed to, again, you could have another uh, criminal liability exposure there for failure to comply. But if you're taking a natural capital approach in any event, these are the sorts of things that you're already beginning be getting to grips with. So you'd be ahead of the curve in terms of where the legislation is actually intending to go in the future. I won't go into too much detail on that, but obviously you'll be able to have the slides and take a bit more of a look at the information in your own time. It will impact a relatively small number of larger businesses, but at the moment we haven't got the, the detail of exactly how they're going to uh, organise that particular requirement. So some further food for thought. You probably have seen in the press uh, that we have had a situation with Rio Tinto where they've destroyed uh, the sacred Aboriginal site in Pilbara, Western Australia, as part and parcel of their uh, ongoing works. Um, it, they were amongst the oldest historic sites in Australia, going back 46,000 years, and there's been some direct consequences for the CEO in that particular instance. Uh, the uh, Rio Tinto's chief exec will lose a total of 2.7 million. Um, there's also uh, consequences for the chief exec of INR and the group exec of corporate relations who will all both lose payouts of more than half a million pounds each. So again, it's an indication that in terms of business, uh, there are going to be direct consequences for those at the top who fail to ensure that the people further down uh, are complying with their duties um, and the corporate policies. So it's certainly something to keep an eye out for. Although not in the uh, sort of scope of environmental issues, strictly speaking, there's also been this recent case with Steve Easterbrook, who was the former CEO of McDonald's. So he was fired um, after having a relationship with an employee. That was in breach of company policy. Nothing unlawful happened, and he left the company with his severance package intact, so nearly £42 million that he walked away with because there was no unlawful conduct. However, <laughs> even though he's left the business, McDonald's is now suing Easterbrook to recoup the severance money. They say they've found further information that shows that actually it was a bit worse uh, than they thought it was in terms of his failure to adhere to company policies. Still not in the region of, of unlawful awful conduct, but there's an, in, there's an interesting point there about whether or not similar claims based on failures to adhere to environmental policies of a particular company could follow on.
So that, that brings us to the end of my particular presentation. I don't know whether or not we have any questions. I'll just stop sharing there. Just one second while we pull that up. Okay, so I think we need to have Sue and Stuart both back off mute if we can and we'll just chat through some of the issues that have come out of our presentations. Can you hear us okay, Alison? Yeah, I can hear you fine, thank you. Sue, are you there? I'm here. Marvellous, excellent, thanks very much. So, um, just reading from the Q&As that we've got through, one second. My Merly eyes do struggle when I'm on the small laptop, I'm afraid, so it can take me a second to work out what's going on. So, we've been asked whether or not we anticipate the financial impact of COVID will have a serious impact on the ability of business to invest in taking a natural capital approach. So I'll just open the floor up on that. So Stuart, do you want to take that one? Um, so, yes, yeah, so, sorry, can you repeat that one again? Uh, yeah, of course, Stuart. Just in essence, do we think that COVID's going to detract from people being committed to dealing with their uh, environmental regulation and or delivering a natural capital approach? I think it's going to. I think it's a really interesting question. I think it's. I know this is going to sound a little bit like sort of dodging the question in some respects, but I think it's going to be very different across different sectors. I think we're seeing significant variation in the way businesses are being impacted, and you know, to some businesses, um, the COVID situation has probably been has seen a significant shift. So think about our own businesses and the way in which people now work from home very easily. I think it, things like that will drive thoughts around changes in behaviours, that's the, some of which are you know, environmental improvements and will be contributing towards kind of net zero and those kind of things. But there'll be other sectors who have obviously had significant financial consequences of this, which is probably going to mean that, you know, their very survival is, 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 is absolutely the heart of their thinking at the moment rather than this. So I think you'll see a mixed picture, but I think I genuinely think there will be opportunities. And I think there is an opportunity for a number of businesses to look at this um, as, a, you know, as something that they can do now. Thanks, Stu. I, I agree with you. I think it, it may go off the boil slightly in the very short term, but I don't think this is an issue that's going away. We've had a couple of questions in as well, uh, just about how, um, could, asking you to expand, Stuart, on the point about monetizing natural capital, and also whether or not there's a generic set of figures to assign to various elements of natural capital, or is it really bespoke? So just issues about how one actually starts assigning monetary value. Okay, so 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 the, so the starting point for that is probably the, the easiest way for me to explain that is 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 things like biodiversity, and you can look at different um, different aspects of ecosystem services, and there are sort of there are some. If you look at the ENCA guidance um, on, on the government website, there are some there are some guidance tables in terms of numbers. I think I think it is it's it, it's not a generic. It's not a generic set of numbers, um, but I think I, I think the important thing is that there's there's not necessarily a right or a wrong answer to a lot of this because because obviously it's, it's quite complicated and nuanced. And I think as I tried to get across in my slides, the starting point is kind of understanding the impacts and dependencies and starting to think about the broader natural capital approach and, and a strategy towards improvement. Developing that would be would be taking numerical values and there are different ways of doing that whether it's using the anchor guidance whether it's using other models from the natural sorry from the capitals coalition website whether it's engaging consultants who can help you attach values it would it would be then a question of looking at what things are in scope so you know are you looking at a site that has biodiversity where biodiversity values are going to be an important part of that monetization or are you looking at something else where you're trying to look at different impacts in your supply chain be it sort of diesel emissions as your through your transportation fleet or whether it's you know the the, the sort of global you know the, the the impact of your raw materials from a different part of the world that actually you know that there will be impacts there and you know it might start off very very simply very high level quite basic and then obviously you can develop that into a more nuanced um model so that's so a slightly woolly answer but 
it sounds to me, Stuart, that, that what you're saying really is at the moment there isn't a sort of a one-size-fits-all. It, Absolutely. It's more of a bespoke approach. Yeah, and I think it would very much depend on the circumstances and, and the scenario. But it would be it would be as simple as taking things like, you know, biodiversity, you know, air quality, um, you know, well-being, you know, soil uh, sorry food resource it, it would be a question of taking those things and looking at you know what are the things that where, where are you getting the benefits and where are you having the impacts and putting those into it essentially a balance sheet um, that, that's that's a, the simplest like, explanation i can give so yeah please do, please do drop a comment in the comments if you want more than that but uh, and i'm happy to pick that up offline if that's if you need any more specific help yeah, I mean, so if people want to look at some examples of um, organisations and companies that have done it, so the, the first company, really, one of the first pioneers was the Caring Group, K-E-R-I-N-G, and they're a global business that own a lot of luxury fashion brands, so they own brands like Gucci, and they created an environmental P&L for their entire business operations, um, and they've been reporting on that for several years now. So I think initially when they assigned the numerical, the financial values against their impacts and their dependencies, it was probably a bit sort of finger in the air. But actually, they can because they've now got that baseline and because they've assigned that value, they can demonstrate progress. They can demonstrate that actually they're making an improvement year on year. And then the other one that's quite interesting to look at is Scot Scottish Natural Heritage. So they published theirs towards the end of last year. Um, and again, it just makes sort of assumptions and judgments in terms of putting a, a monetary value against their assets. And, you know, for example, one of the things they did was said that because they've got all this open space that people can access and go and walk and enjoy, they actually put a value of it was saving the NHS £80 per person in terms of, you know, clean air and that recreational benefit. So, again, it's very, it's very, it's very sort of subjective. But they've got they've got it now as a baseline and they can demonstrate in the future you know how they're improving that as well can i just ask um stuart sue do you see that in terms of you know the investors side of the things getting more interested you know stuart mentioned the um the article the guardian article that that I, I picked up earlier in the week about key investors really looking to drive in that case sort of carbon reductions but obviously there's a clear link through to natural capital and, and avoid the use of sustainable uh, natural resources unless it's done sustainably and um, do you think that those sorts of involvements from investors will start to drive a bit of more of a standardized approach I, th I think I think to some extent yes I think it's difficult to tell at this stage I think what what you will see is that you'll see that you know very much as it said in that article that it's not just about driving things like you know the the, the, the p l aspects of it or the monetization but it's about driving change in behavior it's driving this strategic thinking and as we always say to clients this isn't this isn't about someone writing a report or or, 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 or giving you a, a piece of advice on, you know, on something specific. This is about developing a strategy to, to change your business behaviours over a period of time. And I think that the more that that kind of investor sentiment is, 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 is seen, I think the more the businesses will have to just sort of shape up in terms of the way they approach this kind of thing. And that, in, that invariably will bring you know, a more averaged approach because others will see what others are doing and it will develop that. That more standardization but i don't think this is going to be driven by necessarily by regulatory requirements i think this will be you know a combination of investor investor sentiment consumers all kind of pushing at requiring more to be done thanks you you actually just segued nicely into one of the other questions that we have really? which is where, where is the driver coming from you know is it going to have to be regulation or is it actually coming from businesses themselves is it because they're aware of the fragility of their supply chain or is it really about consumer attention? You know, again, the Thunberg Attenborough effect. You know, lots of businesses are being put under the lens um, by the people who want to buy things from them. Um, so, you know, out of those particular drivers, which do you think is sort of driving businesses harder on this? I, I think. I mean, I, I personally think it's a combination of all of them. But yeah. probably, I think probably, I think those last two. I think the con the consumer and the kind of Thunberg. Um, Attenborough effect are all very big at the moment and I think people you know we all are we sit you know I see it with my kids you know there is an awareness that is far greater than it was 10 years ago about our, our responsibility you know climate change 
as a thing, you know, 10 years ago, people were thinking this was something that would impact our children's children, possibly, and not something that really was going to impact in our lifetimes. And here we are seven years away from, you know, the point of no returns, you know, if, 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 that's, if that's correct. And so I think that, you know, I think it will come from consumers demanding more, investors demanding more, and then a further, uh, you know, business will, will then wake up to that and realise they've got to start looking at risks and resilience and regulatory risk. I mean, the points that you've made, I think, are, are super important in all this, is that this isn't just about is your raw material going to be available? It's about, you know, what's the regulation going to be around it? If, if water, you know, you think about an organisation like Coca-Cola, you know, again, using some big brands that we all know, heavily reliant upon water. If water it becomes far greater regulated in all of their um, manufacturing locations, you know, that could be a, a major impact or a major cost. Just had another question through as well. Um, over to, to both of you on this. Do we think, is there a danger that the 110% becomes a target rather than looking at full potential of the site? I think that's about net gain. Um, I mean, I, I, on that particular point, I, I think there is a danger of that, actually, when you're dealing with local planning authorities in particular, um, if you're talking about the net gain point, because undoubtedly, if you start to give authority something that looks black and white, <laughs> a bit like you must deliver, you know, 10% on top of the baseline, which is obviously 110, um, then that's what they'll require. They might apply whatever metric we end up with as a bit of a black and white approach, rather than being more holistic about sort of biodiversity in the round. Is that something that, that both you and Sue see as a risk as well? I think I think yes, I would entirely agree with that. I think there is a danger of that. I think I think also there's, it's important not to miss the point about um, the, so so if you think about a, a lot of piecemeal ten percent additional versus a sort of a, a more kind of regional strategic yeah. kind of play. The, the, there's, the, and there's differences in, in in value there, isn't there? There's value in the habitat per se, but obviously the value, there's a broader benefit in terms of, um, you know, th th there's been some articles more recently about things like rewilding large yeah. tranches of land, and, and that in itself has a different benefit to just simply saying we've got, you know, 100 hectares here, we're now going to provide 110 hectares in, in its place. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and I've also, I've already seen situations arising with local planning authorities where, you know, that they are sort of applying the metric as a blanket approach and forgetting about where this all came from. So the start of this was the, the white paper on the natural environment, which was back in 2011, Sir Michael Lawson, who put that together. And the biggest thing that he said was fragmentation is our biggest challenge when it comes to biodiversity. So it goes back to your po point, Stuart. It's how do you not miss out on those strategic connections? Because that's actually what really matters, yeah. is to allow wildlife to actually move. Um, because if it can't move, it's fragile. And, 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 you know, one would hope that through spatial planning, there'll be, um, there'll be kind of ambition and, and sort of objectives around that. But, you know, the confidence has to be limited, shall we say. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Just one final question then, um, for you and Sue, uh, do you guys have some um, examples of where taking a natural capital approach actually resulted in a real direct, easy to identify um, financial saving for clients? So there are, there are several examples, really. I mean, so if you look at what the Caring Group have done, who I referenced earlier, you know, there's there's evidence in some of the case studies they've put forward in terms of their supply chain and the materials that they use in their, in their manufacturing, that they actually, as well as it having an environmentally positive impact or less of a a negative impact, they actually made a financial saving. You know, there are evidence of companies who've moved from things like uh, conventional leather to vegan leather, for example, because vegan leather can be made out of, um, it can make it out of cork, it can be made out of pineapple leaves, apple peel, recycled plastics. Um, so again, you know, and it, it, it can be made at a cheaper cost than you know than conventional leather so there are examples such as that um, we've had a client who who secured a preferential rates on a business loan 
based upon you know what they were doing in terms of improving environmental credentials we've seen you know bits and pieces in our business we've looked at you know how we travel we've looked at some of the things we buy you know we we don't have a huge supply chain because we're we're consultants but we've certainly looked at some of our, our sourcing the stuff that we have in our offices um we've also looked at sort of the energy you know the, the, the basic sort of sustainability stuff like energy but yeah there, there are a number of examples out there of where people have seen a financial benefit and then you know Stuart talked about the other part um, earlier about redesigning products and that yeah. whole thing about you know what's the benefit longer term of actually reformulating products and it might be that you can sort of look at look at new markets because of that yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, it, it's going to be something that develops as it goes forward as well, isn't it? And when it comes to sort of following through your supply chain on due diligence as well, there's obviously going to be things like blockchain. Um, from Not that I understand blockchain because I, I don't, <laughs> uh, not on an IT level, but again, it, it's you know, making sure that you've got those processes ingrained in your business so that when the regulation does hit, actually you're ready for it and you've factored it into your financial operating uh, procedures and, and that you're ready with the investment or perhaps already ahead of the game. I think also, Alison, if I could just maybe just add as well, it, it's, it's, far less, it, it's far less tangible. But even things like if you, if you have a, a more engaged workforce, you know, things like staff retention, productivity, you know, productivity those yeah. kind of things, they're, they're very hard to measure. But, but in terms of your business performance, I'd like to bet that, you know, there are benefits there. We all know that, you know, losing and rehiring someone has a direct cost, um, it, it, you know, as well as the loss of productivity. Um, so I think there are, there are other tangential things around that as well that are probably less obvious but worth considering. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it does seem to me that by taking a natural capital approach, not only can businesses protect themselves from potential exposure to environmental liabilities and the cost consequences that flow from that, but there is a real opportunity for them actually to either save money um, or, as I say, develop a, a sort of a bit of a, a leading edge in, in the market in which they're operating. Yeah, very much so. Very much so. Well, I'm just noticing that it's we've got to four minutes past one, um, so we've we've got to the end of our hour. So if uh, if you and Sue are okay with it, I think we'll wrap up there on that positive note because I think it's quite a nice place to end. Um, if anybody does have any questions for any of us um, that you want to pick up with us offline, you should have all of the contact details. Um, the, the slides will be sent out to all of the participants. Please do feel free to either pick up the phone or drop any of us an email, and we'll obviously be happy to, um, to put, take that forward and help in any way that we can. I hope you found it interesting. Thanks very much to Sue and to Stuart for um, making the time to participate. Thanks to you all for making the time to, uh, to join us. Thanks, Alison, and thanks, everybody, for joining. It's been thanks, really everybody. Good. Thank you. Take care. Cheers, Thanks. all. Have a good day. Bye. Cheers. Take bye -bye. care. Bye. Bye.